Hi, this is Peter Brown. We're going to do the lecture on modern technology for growing food from the Industrial Revolution in 1800. That was the creation of steam engine and the use of fossil fuels in England. That really revolutionized the whole world, including agriculture. And then we're going to do a second milestone in growing food. And that was around 1950, around 70 years ago, with the creation of artificial fertilizers, such as nitrogen fertilizer, and the use of pesticide and irrigation uh, to grow food, which really was able to raise our yields of food. Uh, before the Industrial Revolution, all work was done by hand and animals. And this is from Peru. And you can see the terraced fields. They want fields where the uh, soil won't wash down to the bottom. So they build these uh, flat structures called terraces. And that was done by the Incas hundreds of years ago. And they probably used uh, alpacas to carry some of the uh, rocks. But all the work had to be done by humans and by animals. OK, so in the Industrial Revolution, uh, Britain invented the steam engine, and then they were able to uh, use those engines to dig coal to run those machines, and it revolutionized all of life, not just agriculture, but also uh, textiles and clothing and anything you can think of. But you'll see that in the 1800s, nearly all people were involved in agriculture because it took so many people to grow our food. Uh, here is machine invented by Eli Whitney called the uh, cotton gin, and it separated the cotton threads, the part that you used, from the um, seeds of the cotton. And at first it was turned by hand, and then they developed uh, ones that were turned by horses pulling, and then eventually they used engines. So um, I went to school at Penn State, and here is a uh, Amish farmer for philosophical reasons. They don't use electricity. And so we hooked up some draft horses and he's plowing his field with horses. So think about how much labor that has to involve, taking care of those horses, feeding those horses, shoveling the horse manure. So just to get those horses in shape and hooked up to ride out in the field. And then here's another farmer, and this one happens to be a picture from Cuba and he's turning the soil over and plowing his field with a tractor. So let's look at how uh, the U.S. population involved in farming has changed. So if people were living in the U.S. 200 years ago, nearly all the people were living on farms. That's because before the Industrial Revolution, if you wanted to eat, you had to work the farm. By, 50, by 100 years later, half the population had moved off farms, a lot of them to cities, and that created problems as well. Because one of the most dangerous compounds to drink if you lived in the city was milk. Milk was teeming with bacteria. People used things like formaldehyde uh, to preserve it, to make it so it didn't spoil, which was terrible for you as well. And so one of the worst things to drink if you lived in the city was milk. And then in the early 1900s, they developed refrigeration and so by 2000, it was easy to live off the farm and less than 2% of us today uh, live or work on farms. Most of us have non-farm jobs and the FDA regulates our food safety as long as other agencies. And we have one of the safest food supplies in the world in the United States. So here's a graph from the USDA and it goes from 1850 to 2017. And it's showing you that we had uh, uh, six million farms back in the early 1900s, and today we only have about two million farms. At the same time the family farm has declined, the corporate farm has increased. So the average farm size is much larger today than it was 100 years ago. So a lot of farms nowadays aren't family farms at all, but uh, large farms owned by corporations like Hickman's farm that produces eggs on the west side. They just have thousands and thousands of chickens and thousands and thousands of eggs produced. And it's a corporation that owns it. It's not a little family farm. Okay. Meanwhile, the land for farming has held steady. And so that's saying that somehow we've been able to grow all our crops on less land. And we'll see why as we go on.
Okay. Um, so in the 1950s, the ability to grow larger yields or more crops on the same amount of land became known as the Green Revolution. And it was brought about by artificial nitrogen fertilizer, the uh, combination of the work of Haber, and then new breeds of crops that would grow and yield more with that increased nitrogen fertilizer, and then other things like irrigation and pesticides. So high inputs to get higher yields on the same amount of land. And so here's a figure showing the yield of grain from 1960 to 2010 around the world. Why do we focus on grain? Because rice, wheat, and corn provide half the calories around the world. So prior to the Green Revolution, if you wanted more crops, you cleared more trees and got more land. But between 1960 and 2010, around the world, you can see the path of grain yield was up, 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 up. And if you look just to the United States, it was even more steep because some countries haven't been able to adopt the uh, aspects of the Green Revolution uh, especially poor countries around the world. But anyways, you can see that grain yields worldwide doubled over the past 70 years, and that's due to these high inputs, uh, irrigation, nitrogen fertilizer, pesticides. And of course, land is an important resource in this country, so you don't want more and more land having to be shifted to uh, farmers' fields in order to grow more crops, and you can see over the past uh, 70 years, the amount of land that's been used to grow crops has held steady or even come down slightly in the past 20 years. So we supply all our needs, and a lot of the crops grown in the United States are even exported. So back in the 1960s, people said we weren't gonna have enough food to feed the population. There was a very high rate of population growth that peaked in 1962 at 2.1% far more people were being born than were dying. However, since then, it's been going down. And so by 2019, the rate of population growth was 1% and it will level off, it's predicted at 2100. So we'll have a constant about 11 billion people on the planet and we have plenty of food to feed the, to feed the world. Part of the increase in population now isn't due to more people being born than dying, it's due to just people living longer. And we know that as countries become wealthier and healthier around the world, the population growth rate decreases and the increased population, a lot of it is due to the fact that people are living longer. Watch these two little videos about human population growth and the current trend worldwide is women having fewer babies and some people look at it and say, well, there are cultural reasons and this reason, that reason. And that's probably true. People who are more rural and farmers have more babies. Certain religions have more babies. But overall, the trend is as countries get wealthier and people live longer, there are reasons to have, have less babies. You're, you're confident that your babies are going to live. The mortality rate goes down as you move away from an agrarian society where everybody's a farmer you don't need as many kids okay here is a picture of norman borlaug he was called the father of the green revolution and he's at a uh, a conference in iowa uh, about 20 years ago he passed away about 10 years ago and here's what he did he won the nobel prize in 1970 and here's what he did to become the father of the Green Revolution. When these artificial nitrogen fertilizers came out, the yields of grain were so heavy that the grain fell over and rotted. So he used conventional breeding to make short, stiff varieties of wheat that could hold these higher levels of grain. And he worked around the world in poor countries. You had to ad adopt the varieties to the countries, and he set up institutes where other scientists, local scientists, and to a large extent, did the same thing for rice and corn, so that in combination with these artificial nitrogen fertilizers and irrigation and pesticides, you could get far higher yields of wheat, rice, and corn. Again, we focus on wheat, rice, and corn because that's a half the world's calories. So here's a response for, from Norman Borlaug to people who say, well, the Green Revolution, it's not organic and 
people have been growing food for thousands of years. You should let them do things their traditional way. So he said, some of the environmental lobbyists of the Western nations are the salt of the earth, but many of them are elitists. They sit in their office and tell us what to do. They've never experienced a physical sensation of hunger. If they lived one month amid the misery of the developing world, as I have for 50 years, they'd be crying for tractors and fertilizer and irrigation canals. So what technologies led to the Green Revolution? Artificial fertilizers, including nitrogen, the ability to, to breed plants that would uh, stand up to those higher levels of nitrogen. Things like tractors, things like artificial irrigation, things like pesticides to kill the insects, to kill the weeds. Okay, so what is the biggest benefit of the Green Revolution? Think about whether we spend more or less as percent of our income on food today than we did back in the 1950s. Okay, what do you think? Okay, and here's the chart. If you lived in 1950, you probably spent about 20% of your income on food. It's been going down, 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 down until it stabilized about in 2000. And so today we spend about 10% of our income on food. We spend half on food today compared to what we did in the 1950s. And why is that? Because these large farms that are mechanized can grow a lot of food very cheaply. That's the benefit of the Green Revolution. Okay, if we look at it a different way, here's a breakdown again from the USDA, and they say the average, per, average person, their big, big expense is housing. About a third of their income is housing. The next biggest expense is, is your car, your transportation. About an eighth of your income grows for transportation. Uh, they calculate their data a little differently. So they, instead of 10%, they say close to 13% of your income goes for food. Okay, so those are the three biggest, and then it, you can look through the others if you want. Okay. Uh, this is an interesting graph from the USDA. It kind of confirms what we already know. And if you look at the, this goes from 1960 to 2015, and if you look at the green bar, the green bar shows spending on food away from home, like if you stop at McDonald's, and uh, blue is at home. So another trend that we're aware of about half of our food money now goes for purchases away from home. So what's the drawback of the Green Revolution? The drawback is when you use these high inputs, you deplete the water supply. The fertilizer becomes a source of pollution. The pesticide becomes a source of pollution. There are some harms to these big farms that grow just one crop, something called monoculture. So irrigation, here's a picture of eight Midwestern states and underneath these eight mid Midwestern states is a big aquifer called the Ogallala Aquifer. And a third of all the irrigation used in farming comes from this aquifer. The colored um, parts of the aquifer show where the level has increased and where the level has declined. So these little blue areas show there's actually an increase in water but for most of the aquifer, there's a decline. A lot of it's orange and some of it's red. So an orange is 10 to 20 or 20 to 40, and a red is more than 40%. Okay, they say if we stop pumping groundwater today, it would take 6,000 years to get back to where we were before they started pumping from the Ogallala aquifer. So we're pumping more water than can be um, restored so it's really a non-renewable uh, resource. So we have to think about that and how we're using that water. Similarly, we have to think about where the water comes from Arizona. Our water comes from the Colorado River and Lake Mead to a large extent, and Lake Mead is at a historically low level. So we will have to start thinking about uh, how we use our water here in Arizona. Two thirds of the water in Arizona is used for agriculture. And so in cities, we're unaware that there's a water shortage because as they start cutting back, the first people that will see those cuts are people in agriculture. Uh, before Fritz Haber invented the use of nitrogen fertilizer, it was hard to get higher yields. And his original goal was to make bombs for the Germans in World War II since nitrogen is explosive. 
And in 1920, he was awarded the Nobel Prize for Chemistry, they said, for improving the standards of agriculture and well-being of mankind. Why was that? Because by adding high pressure and temperatures, he was able to pull nitrogen from the atmosphere and make it into a form that plants could use, artificial nitrogen fertilizer. You can th see that the amount of nitrogen fertilizer added to crops has increased from about 10 million tons to over 100 million tons around the world. And so uh, by adding nitrogen fertilizer, you're able to uh, get higher yields. So what's the harm of adding this nitrogen fertilizer? Well, the harm is downstream. So if you're a farmer, fertilizer is just a small bunch of your costs. You're also paying for your land and paying for your crops and so on. And so if you add too much fertilizer, when it rains, the rainfall washes the fertilizer into the river. And then the river, two thirds of the United States, drains into the Mississippi. And then the Mississippi drains out to the Gulf of Mexico. So adding extra nitrogen fertilizer for the farmer is just some insurance so they'll have the highest yield possible. But that nitrogen fertilizer goes downstream into the Gulf of Mexico or on the East Coast into the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, read or listen to the article on the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico and see what the problem is with ex excess nitrogen fertilizer going into the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, similarly, pesticide use helps the crops, and so you get crops that uh, need to be sprayed for fungus, that need to be sprayed for bugs, that need to be sprayed to keep the weeds down. But there are harms from this pesticide use, so uh, exposure to the pesticides, and especially for people working directly with the pesticides. I know some people are into organic foods, and the amount of pesticides and the stuff you buy in the grocery store is really trivial. Uh, you're better off eating fruits and vegetables and not worrying about pesticides than saying, oh, I can't eat fruits and vegetables because I can't afford organic foods. Uh, but there's also environmental harm to the environment from all this uh, spraying. So those are the harms from pesticide use. And you can see since 1960 to 2010 that the amount of pesticide sprays on crops have, have gone up. And if they divide it up, uh, it's mostly herbicides. Herbicides are sprays that keep weeds down. And then the blue uh, represents um, insecticides, so things that kill insects. And you can see that's gone down. The, the bar of the blue is smaller. And the red represents fungicides. It's like if you get athlete's foot, it's a fungus. A fungus is what killed the potatoes in Ireland in the 1800s. And the yellow is kind of a hodgepodge of other things that plants get sprayed with. So a lot of crops today are genetically engineered. They have genes from other organisms introduced. And the two most common uh, engineered aspects are a gene that makes them resistant to herbicides, especially glyphosate, and a gene that makes some crops uh, produce a natural pesticide that kills caterpillars. So if we look at these genetically engineered crops in the United States, they say about 90% of the crops grown in the United States are genetically engineered. So HT means they're herbicide tolerant, so herbicide tolerant cotton and soybean, herbicide tolerant corn, and then BT is the naturally occurring soil bacteria, Bacillus thuringiensis, that makes corn and cotton uh, have a natural pesticide that's resistant to caterpillars. Okay, so they're actually spraying more glyphosate on crops because they don't have to worry about accidentally killing the crops. Uh, glyphosate sometimes called Roundup. If you use Roundup in your home, I wouldn't worry too much about it because you're not using a lot of it, but people who use it all the time, there is some very weak evidence that glyphosate use is linked to non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and the maker of Roundup has paid a $10 billion uh, suit to settle cancer lawsuits. 
Uh, the court systems are different than the scientific community. So even though they've been found guilty in the court systems, uh, scientists aren't uh, so convinced that glyphosate is causing non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So if environmental issues interest you, there's a course we teach called Bio 105, and Bio 105 is environmental biology, and it's taught by some really good uh, professors here. But I just pull up an article to see if there are pesticides in the environment, and here was an article in September of 2014, and it looked at pesticides uh, in the groundwater for about a 17-year period. And they looked at 83 compounds and they followed it over this period. And they found half the samples had traces of pesticides, but they were at such low levels that they were below what the uh, government agencies considered to be safe. So most corn and soybeans in this country are genetically engineered. So here's a, a nice YouTube video about genetic engineering in our food. In the United States, um, you will eat genetically engineered food unless you have uh, bought all your food as organic. And you say, well, gee, I don't buy fruits and vegetables, so I don't eat genetically engineered food. Nope, that's not true. Because if you're eating uh, something that has uh, corn syrup, that corn syrup was made from genetically engineered corn. If you're eating something that was cooked in soybean oil, that soybean oil was made from soybeans that were genetically engineered. So the federal agencies in the United States say that genetically engineered food is no different than regular food, and it doesn't have to be separately labeled. So all of you are eating genetically engineered food. All right, uh, monoculture. So monoculture is when these big farms just grow, grow one type of crop. Uh, the disadvantage to monoculture is uh, crops are more prone to diseases and insects, so then they have to be sprayed more with things like fungicides and pesticides. And they do that that the crop will all ripen at once and all be harvested at once. If you click and watch the wheat harvesting, I mean, it's amazing to watch how uh, these big machines just with just a single operator can harvest uh, acres and acres of wheat. And that's why we've been able to reduce the people who work on farms so much and why food is so inexpensive. Um, one of the things that if you grow food yourself, that's fun to do is not to grow the varieties that are found in the grocery stores. So there are a lot of traditional varieties called heirloom varieties. If you click on native seed search in Tucson, they have a lot of varieties of plants that were um, used by Native Americans. And if you're Native American, sometimes you can get these for free. Uh, I've sometimes, when I just want to buy a few seeds, I've bought raw seeds from Sprouts. So I've planted peanuts from sprouts, I've, I've planted mung beans from sprouts, and they seem to grow just fine. So if you buy raw seeds, uh, you can get a few seeds from sprouts and plant them yourself. And so sometimes it's fun to uh, do that. And then I've ordered uh, from catalogs, and uh, a lot of times the seeds in the grocery store, the fruits in the grocery store, are selected for uh, their looks and whether they ship well rather than their taste. So sometimes these heirloom varieties are fun to grow. And then uh, apparently we use about 300 species of plants widely for food, but there are thousands of plants out there that can be used as food. And so once in a while, a, a new food breaks through. And so quinoa has become the hot, hot new food. Like so many other plants, it originally came from Peru and Bolivia. So here's a red quinoa growing in Bolivia. It's not a grain, it's not a grass family. Instead, it's in the amaranth family. So if you don't want to eat gluten, it's gluten-free, and it's higher in protein than grains are. 